Um, Eva, thank you very much for inviting me into this beautiful shop, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's not just a shop, because you've got the studio downstairs yeah. as well. So just for the benefit of our audio listeners that m might not be watching the video, um, can you describe where, what, what's in the shop today? Yeah. Um, so Sigmar is a, we're a design forum, a design company. And we are based interior design and architecture. And we have this amazing shop where we then obviously sell retail, passing trade, we're online, and then we have an agency where we sort of um, represent amazing artisans um, that also um, strike a chord with our philosophy. Uh, in the shop, we have a mix of, I would say, it's to mostly Western modernist p collector's pieces, as it is now, and then we have some amazing crockery from Wurz, that Denmark, which is current, and that also represents the fact that um, it's not just vintage. Um, I think our, our design company is based from modernist history, form, and art, mm -hmm. uh, and it's just not modernist, but we're still in modernism if you're going to push that conversation far enough, I suppose. But uh, newly made things that are made with the same spirit is something we very much want to anchor ourselves in, and hence we do represent and try to support artisans and design in the same way. So we like mixing it. Okay. But then there are, I mean, the, we have a Mogenskoch uh, cabinet behind me that holds the Wurtz um, crockery. That's cabinet makery at its finest. They are also reproduced today, so you can order newly made ones, but you can order them. You can have the vintage ones from the original years and so on. We just like to combine the difference between new and old, and we'd like to educate people within it. So it's it's amazing. I mean, the shop is a little bit to be the indulge yourself and surround yourself with beautiful things and yeah. touch them and hear their story. We have amazing staff who knows all the story. You can just come in and be told the story of pieces. You don't buy anything. It's nice if you buy something, but you don't have to. <laughs> and I mean, it's it's on the King's Road in Chelsea in yeah. London. Um, which is one of my favorite roads. I mean, there are many, many still sh shops that have been around for decades and yes. you know, we're in a tough time. People are fighting to, to stay alive on, on this street as well. And there's the, um, only a little while ago there was an art shop. That yeah, Greenstone. It's a real shame because it was around for They are time. around, they just don't fall on road. Okay. Advertising. <laughs> <laughs> no, they just moved. Yeah. They moved location. But, I'm imagining that people will pass the shop and they're just intrigued and they will, they, they'll, they'll come in. What, how do you, what's, what is your typical customer, would you say, that comes in here? Good question. Typical customer, we don't really have a typical. Uh, I would say it really spans all ages. I'm not sure the younger ages that shopper due to finances, but we have so many people coming in and touching and talking and wanting to see, uh, which is also for us trying to, I hope that means that we're not too intimidating. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, especially on King's Road and Price Bracket, that people stay in the door and go, how much is that? And they don't come in, but people very much come in. We have a very loyal following of, of kind of serious collectors of, of the pieces in the furniture that we represent. Okay. Uh, we also have people, I mean, we have some, we have, I think we've developed a, a crack-like addiction following of our crockery, which is really nice. Slightly. Literally, yeah. no, we have, we have a lady that came in last week, really cool, I think she's in her 50s, and she comes in maybe once every three weeks and buys one or two pieces of crockery. And I asked her, I said, you could, you could also pick some pieces and we set them aside because they, they go really quick. Yeah. She's like, no, I like, I now like the whole procedure. Like, I go by and then I, I want more and I want to come and I want to rummage. And I thought, oh, you're like a, my favorite customer <laughs> right now. People really love that. So we have things like that. People like that who buy, who spend 40 quid yeah. on, on crockery. And they make the, the journey down here from, in her case, from, from Hampstead, because that's where she yeah. lives. Or we have people who really do want to buy pieces. They also come in looking for particular collectibles. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we have a, a quite large interior of design clientele. 
and obviously we source for them too. So yeah, it's, it's a mishmash. Is it a place yeah. where you're interior design clients? They, they come in here, you sit them down and you, you like, because it's a very inviting, warming place to be. So do you talk about like their project here? Yeah, time. well, in the office yeah. downstairs, yes, yeah. we have most of our meetings there if we don't go to them, depending uh-huh. on big presentations usually are held here because there's an enormous amount of samples and yeah. floors and things. Uh, but absolutely, part of part of who we are is very much to integrate the shop and the, the, the office are sort of integrated and it should be yeah. homely. Yeah. It's not supposed to feel like an office. No. I mean, it does because it's a massive mess downstairs. But it's but hidden away in, in, in this, this it is It is, and you walk through this living room mm-hmm. in order to sit down and back. So we'd like to feel, make people feel like they've come to your house. How long has it been here for, the shop? 2003. And has it been uh, a rocky ride? Oh, mm. gosh. I mean, anyone who starts a company A would know what that is. Uh, and, you know, it, it, uh, it takes about five to ten years to sort of establish whether whether you really want this. Yeah. So it takes yeah. a while if you can survive that long. It's been a rocky ride. We've gone through two recessions, um, but that actually falls back on even more being passionate about what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, not move too strategically, as in really have a passion, work hard yeah. is key. But that's that's the you know box A tech for any entrepreneur. Exactly. Then you come comes in with the Harvard degree to how to run and grow it. <laughs> Uh, but it's been a rocky ride, but I think it's been a passionate and, and, and honest ride. We really want to be here. That's, you can that's feel that. Yeah, you know? you can and this is, we really want to do this. Mm-hmm. And you do have to, for us to be two women running this. I mean, we started here with sort of selling all the furniture around. That's sort of how it really started. It's, oh my God, I feel like I'm an X Factor now talking about <laughs> but no that you don't create bands and they, they <laughs> practice in garages this is a really weird comparison I think it really did start like in the garage it's we have literally renovated this place ourselves we started with my furniture we did all this yeah uh, Nina is a an amazing walking dictionary and an incredible passionate person and who could who doesn't sell you things, she really tells you a story. Yeah. Uh, I have the same passion, but I come from an interior architectural background. And yeah. I think together we really wanted to be here and we really wanted to be personal. And so I think that's why we're still here, to be honest. Yeah. A little luck on top of that. Um, let's talk a little bit about you. Mm. So give us a little bit about the background of, of you and where you, how you've got to where you are today as well. Right. Uh, I'm Swedish. I'm half Swedish, half Danish. Um, yeah, I, the accent comes from... I, I, uh, I took my first BA in, in, uh, in Stockholm in Sweden and then I went on to study at Parsons in New York. And I stayed in New York for quite a while. Okay. So the accent sort of stuck. And then uh, I moved over here in 2001 and we started Sigmar. I mean, I did interior design then. Um, I met Nina because I started sourcing through her pieces, and we just I discovered my style mates. I mean, I would go in and say, "I think I'm, I'm looking for. I think I'm looking for this, and this is the style, and she would understand me." And we ended up doing a few interiors that she sourced for me, where this was just born. We didn't have a name at the time, but we we decided we were going to do something. In 2003, we started sort of this. I think this came, we opened here, did we open in 2004? Don't exactly remember the date we opened the doors, because it takes a while to get yourself sorted. But we opened without a name, in fact. Uh, so I've gone from the product design interiors route, you know, comes from uh, B, from Christie's and from historical and. Uh, sales and retail okay. side. We've both met in the middle. Uh, and it's all about the philosophy and the story. And then when we opened this, Sigmar, I mean, we just tried to find a name more because we didn't want to put our names. At the time, there, the logo was still in. People did logos. Yeah. We didn't want a logo. And also, it was all very rock stardom. 
so it was all about fashion designer names, rock star names, mm -hmm. and we felt that it was individualist in a way that where it didn't, oh, I'm sounding very socialist now, which I don't want to be, but I think that it's more about we wanted to be, we wanted to be more of a philosophy. It, that sounds very flyy as well, but it was literally, we wanted a name that people could have no emotional association to, mm -hmm. but would remember. That proved really hard. So we opened for three months without a name because we couldn't find one. Tyler Perlet was an amazing, or well, is, he's still alive, but he, he started, he was uh, the editor uh, of Wallpaper at the time. And he gave us a lot more credit than we deserved. I, I think he thought it was cool to just open with, oh, and oh, cocky yeah. to be, be with no name. Exactly. Was actually, I'm admitting officially now that there was no plan, there was, we didn't have a name. <laughs> So we didn't have a name, so we couldn't order a sign. And Sigma came about because of uh, long discussions. Sigma Polka was a um, painter, I believe he died in uh, 2006 or something around there. Uh, we met him. We just liked his name and he also, the symbolism of his art, how, what he saw, beauty in the detail, that mm -hmm. we also thought was quite interesting. Uh, Sigma, the, it just stuck and we felt that it was a graphic a graphic that looked good, it was something that sort of tasted good in your mouth and yes. you remembered it but it didn't have an emotional attachment. Then I'm so happy and so proud of that name because it still works. It is, it's a beautiful name and it, and it sticks. It to, sticks. And it's easy to pronounce, it's, 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 it's the right one. Um, did you come up with any other names? Was there any other names Oh, that you we, have like, we have like 300 million <laughs> other names and they were so bad. Yeah. It's so, I mean... It's you tough. know what, people who work with, with advertising and who do mm. copyright and things like that, highest respect, head yeah. off to them, because yeah. this was like the, the worst, the worst challenge we've gone through was to come up with a name, you stuck with it forever. You are, that's it. You know? Yeah. So. Or some, yeah, you can go for a very daring move of changing your name sometimes down the road, but, or yeah. shortening it, but. No, I think this is a, it's a perfect name, and it's yeah. Suits. Luckily, we are. Yeah. So that's the very windy story. Um, did you always want to do interior design? No. As a career? No. Whoever do you do what you thought you were going to do? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I I'm trying to remember. I mean, there was a lot of careers in there. I come from a completely different sort of, I was going to get the answer, I was going to be something yeah, completely different. But the design aspect um, has had its journeys because you discover where your skill lies. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've had the self-esteem to think I had any skill particular for, for anything really, but I, I really knew I, what I burned for. I think it's been fate that I ended up with, all, with this type of furniture. I have always loved the modernist era. I've also been so I've been lucky enough to be brought up with beautiful things. Uh, my grandparents especially had the most wonderful things, always textural, colorful and textural and tactile. And I think that was always what I wanted to do. But yeah. you don't know it, you know, when you're just a person yeah, who yeah. just touches things. Which also I think why it's led me into interior design is you observe people as you walk, work with them. Mm -hmm. I feel in a very, actually I don't think it's that silly. I think we're the new doctors and nurses of today and that's not trying to make it rocket science. It literally is, people may come to you and say, I want you to help me make my home nice. It's also what I say, can you help me clean up my mess? Can you <laughs> help me get in every day where I can enter my house and for 60 seconds take, have a breath and calm down and yeah. good. We live 160 miles an hour. We do. We, we just need, you need a haven and you need somewhere where you actually can recollect yourself and recoup. Mm -hmm. I think that's been my calling. I think I'm not a better designer than anyone else. I don't think I'm eye for anything that people don't have. I do know how to observe things and watch when I can find. My sense of tactility is where I would watch you know, I will within a few days know how you sort your shoes, what it is you touch, what your movements are in your flat, what you're drawn to. It's about interviewing right, it's about wanting it. That's the biggest pleasure. 
of the discovery of, of someone. The, the, the discovery of someone, but it's also even without having to invade their privacy mm -hmm. to, to see the end result where people feel good. You know, when everything has a place, yeah, and it is a, it feels like it's got harmony to you, which means the right colors, the right balance, the right space. That shows, and people yeah. are so happy. And if they're on top of it, would be like, it feels like I did it. I don't. I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. Or it feels like me. I mean, the biggest compliment is that it doesn't look like the designer did it. Mm. The biggest compliment is it looks like you. Whether it's your house or your office, or your hotel or your restaurant, yeah, that personal touch it needs to not look like a spread. So, I mean, you've you've been definitely recognised for your skill and what you do. I mean, you've got many awards that you've won oh, as yeah. well. I know that it's amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get giddy. I think it's such a silly thing, awards, but it's. It's like walking around in a massive like yeah. hug when people, when when there are awards given to you. We you I mean we wouldn't enter pay. No. We would never enter competitions mm. that you pay for or whatever else. I think that's. I'm not big into advertising. I actually think that word of mouth has to be it, and recognition by your peers has to be it. Yeah. Which also makes it nerve wracking, but you just have to focus. You keep your head down and just work. And I just think that when you get granted an award by, like, like now the town and country's fifty finest designers, or housing gardens top one hundred, these are things that really, I mean, to me, I feel like I've been given roses every day. Because it's that recognition. Because it is you recognition, work really hard. and it's recognition from a place that you respect, and it's also. If it's every f three years, I mean, yeah. it's, it's our little Oscars, isn't it? Yeah. And I, to me, that means a lot. It means a lot whether it leads to business or not, mm -hmm. because it just, it is such a compliment. Yeah. But yeah. it is, I mean, yeah, it's to me. It's always good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been on your website. Amazing, amazing project <coughs> that you've done as well. And I, I would recommend anyone to go to your website and have a look. Um, we can give the details at the end. Um, but today, we're actually here to talk about um, the importance of colour. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I'm going to pretend I know absolutely nothing about it. So if you can just explain um, the importance of colour in a residential home or in, in interior design itself. Absolutely. I think what I, we should approach it from how to apply colour. Okay. I think colour and texture that goes hand in hand. So, to start it with, you have to think that color, not, not just not talking just primary colors, which means blue and red and green and yellow, mm -hmm. but it's all the nuances in between and also the undertones of a color. You shouldn't underestimate the psychology of color, and it's very real. It, there's nothing proven, there's no proven science to color, it's all hypothetical. However, no one can deny that. Color can has the power to affect your mood. Yeah. It affects, you know, it, it can annoy you, it can empower you, it can relax you, it can do all of those. So the application of color that spills in the texture um, is also where you can hide the glue, sort of the glue or the little pieces of tape that ties things together. So you know when you walk into a room and it feels like it's just working, or it ties together, that's, it's a sense of harmony. But that's hard, it's not tactile, that's, that's hard to pinpoint. Yeah. Now that, that's a little trickery, that's it, and it's, it's not that hard. But it is to not try to stand something out, it is to try to, if you place those strategic points right, mm -hmm. it will tie together no matter what you put into the space. This is for application of color is incredibly important. I personally have focused a lot on the grayscale, uh, and my paint collection is now, well, we, I think we came out the first with it in 2011, so it's a long time ago, and we've been very low-key with it. Uh, that's still in evolution. 
but I've based it on grayscale. It, to not have too wide a scale, but it's also to then have things too tight together. So in the grayscale, you can have undertones. So I can have a, an example. You can have a very light, incredibly light gray that looks like a broken white. So if you say, oh, I want a bedroom, I, want a, I, I like the idea of a bright bedroom. Mm. I like light colors. Uh, but I want it warm and soft. And no, oh, yeah, I'm not a great sleeper. Nightmare condition for me, because what people have to remember is the, now white is a combination of all colors. Yeah. And light bounces of it. So your room will be bright even when the lights are off. So to get it dark is going to be difficult. Now, if you're a bad sleeper, you actually need that scientifically. So to me, it's then about how do I think further than that? When you say warm, this is also what people talk. I have to analyze what you mean. Warm doesn't mean that you want it in the warm tones. You, it's, it's a hue question. It's a feeling. Yeah. So I can take a grayscale. So I, can, but I wouldn't use whites. I use a gray which looks like a broken white, but there is a lot more both brown and black in it. So it doesn't, so it turns it down. But I may have a, a lavender colored back, like breaking color in the, in the background of it. That will make that hue appear softer to your eye. So that's again how that will just be. You will see it when you, if I show it to you here, you'll be like, yeah, this looks whitey. I show it up against something and you're like, oh my god, that's lavender. Yeah, okay. Like, no, this so it's is quite deceiving. Very deceiving. Yeah. If I then put that in a room that has a little bit more subdued light, I'll put uh, warmer toned woods in it. That won't pick up on the lavender, but it will warm up the perception, so it'll give you more of a yellow tone into the, the wall, but the yellow will be broken because it's a grey. So there's, I mean, this sounds all messed up, but it's, it is about you not straining your eye, you know, when you're trying to. Yeah. So you're going to walk in there and it's going to feel soft, but it also needs to bounce less, less light. All of this is where I work with in knowledge, but I'll also combine it with texture. I will then make sure that if you have a carpet in there, uh, in Britain people like carpet in their bedrooms, I will make sure it's a very textural carpet. Mm. So there's movement, not just a sensation of soft under your foot. So something that's quite thick, would you say? Thick, and I would actually go, there's going to be a texture. Okay. I would maybe do even a, 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 a knotted one. And if you are a rug person, so Scandinavia would dream of having a carpet, you will have a wooden floor, but you may still want warm underfoot. Yeah. I would probably go for a very thick flat weave. You'd have to create texture somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you get warmth, not just through color. It has to work with texture. Yeah. And that's, texture is dimensional. So... I can go on and talk forever about this, but that's an, an example. Okay. Another example is to echo patterns. That also plays in with color. But I can have a neutral colored wall that plays on a tone in a weave. So, well, over there, you can't see it right now, is a Joseph Frank chair, but that has a rope seat, a roped seat. And so you can have a roped seat that is in an oatmeal type color that you can have picked up on the wall. Now the rope seat is then woven, not only is it the rope, but it's woven in a pattern. Mm. I can echo that pattern again on subtly and a pattern on a rug or a carpet. You won't directly see it unless I yeah, tell you to Yeah, see it. I was going to say. And this is where that harmony, because it all ties together then. So these are the little tape of the glue bits I was talking about before. Where it it's all sort of grabbing onto one another so it can hold on. Mm. That is what I think is the sophistication of interior designers, where the difference between the, the, I have great taste and I can do it myself and you might, but the trained eye. Yeah. So sometimes to get help from an interior designer can be just that, the fact that the little guidance of the little things, they all tie it together. It's kind of like, I mean, would you, would you say that if, a, if your, your typical client, if they say, like, I love it, I've got it, they don't actually have to understand it because 
it's you that actually has to understand it, like how things are, like how you've managed to achieve that. Yes, but I have to connect with my client. Yeah. And I think actually, if I'm going to have credibility, if I can't explain why I'm worth the fee, yeah. then I'm not worth my fee. Yeah. And so to me, that is, as long as I can explain this, mm-hmm. then it would make sense for you to go, I get it. You can still, you still have the power to say, but you know what, I don't like it. Yeah. And you know what, that's just like with wine. You can't be a snob. If you don't like it, you don't like it. It's not your taste. And that's okay, and that's what it should be. But it should be my job to say, I can try to take your taste and I'm going to decipher it. And I'm going to try to put it together in a different molecular structure and I'm going to try and apply it. So it still is you. But this is how it's going to work. It may also help educate for the future. I think if you buy, also especially it says you spend money on pieces you're going to buy. And sometimes that can be painful. Especially when you're like, this light's amazing and great, but you're like, why would I want to spend sixteen hundred pounds on a lamp yeah. when I can, you know, a painful price range? Yeah. If you can feel that this has connection to things that you also purchased, why would you not be able to move it with you? Yeah. And then tie it together, but you know which pieces belong together and why they would be. Mm. I think to me these things are incredibly real and it's what makes my job both hard and fun. Not hard, challenging is a better word. Um, yeah, I actually think that, that the interior design has a massive place and more now than ever has relevance. It's a massive thought process that you probably have to go through from the beginning of meeting a client to talking about colours, textures and everything else. Do you have... Between... After you've actually had that discovery and you've spoken to the client, how long does the average project take for that thought process to work before you come with an idea? Ah, uh, poof, that's a good question. It, it depends on how early they, what they ask us for and how early it is yeah. and how big it is. Yeah. Uh, a two bedroom flat versus 7,000 square foot house is a two different pr- procedures. Yeah. Uh, However, I would say from, from agreement, from when we have staked out exactly what it is we're going to do, mm. uh, I would say uh, three weeks to a month is the first, first, then that's when we recoup and go, let's go, let's, let's look at this, yeah. uh, providing we have, then we will, you know, during that time we'll make some sort of, if there isn't a blueprint, we'll have to have one made. Uh, and then for us to be able to say, okay, this is what I think I've, verbally translated you yeah, well, to yeah. translate it what you said to me verbally into and this, this and yeah. am I am I out sailing somewhere or am I getting somewhere into harbor you know is this is this good that's usually the procedure I wouldn't say it takes longer for the first if we need to touch base quite early mm-hmm. and then it can take anything from four months to 18 months to, uh, to finish a project depending on size and workload going back to talking about color and texture, um, have you ever had a client that has told you what they want, but then you've found that you've offered them almost the complete opposite, but then, but then they've found that they actually love that, or you were right in, in that point. So they kind of like come to you with that idea, but it's wrong. I it's think right. we, it's, I wouldn't put it that way because it's not about me being right uh, or them being wrong, but I'm going to put it in a scenario that may chance it. It happens all the time, uh-huh. but that's also part of the success. If you knew exactly what you wanted, why are you asking me yes. to do it? Yeah. You are asking me to say, can you interpret what I say and give me something new? Yeah. Or help me spend only this money because if I do it, it will get bits and pieces and it's wrong. Yeah. Or help me refine this. So that is, people do want an input, but it's their house, so it is up to me to interpret. I get it all the time, but for example, I mean, I get, there's a lot of people who go, I like, you know, I'm a very traditional person, um, but, you know, I like things contemporary, but it's in a traditional way, and you go, you can hear that as a contradiction, because it is. Yeah. Or I can try to hear what is there, are they trying to say. It could be that what you're trying to say is 
I'm not used to an interior being laid out in any other way than what I've seen before. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to separate. I mean, to me, a living room has two sofas and two chairs. That may be what they mean. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, this. Uh, I don't use bedspreads. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this. So you have to just listen between the lines. So I think there's always something that I feel that we bring to the table. But I feel that the client educates us back equally because it's about teaching them how to feed us back. Mm -hmm. We immediately tell people, let's start a Pinterest, come in and tell me what you like, send me pictures. And the more feedback we teach them to give us, and this is why, going back to your previous question, I need to learn to translate to them why I'm doing what I'm doing yeah. so they can follow me. Or I go, oh, I didn't like that idea. Or I go, oh, they spin off on it. So it is almost always a collaboration. So it's never really about wrong, right? It just sort of ends up being this, which is, I think, if people are happy, it's because they feel they've contributed. You know? Yeah, that's also important, I guess. I mean, they don't yeah. want to walk into my space, do yeah. they? They no. want to walk into their house. That's it, yeah. And I can't tell them, you know, ta-da! I mean, I'm a bad class, I bet it goes, here's the keys, I'll be back in spring. Yeah. But that's not very often. Can you tell us um, about a project that you're working on now? Like, you must have a few. So, mm -hmm. could you tell us something exciting? Are you working on something exciting at the moment? Very exciting. Um, we are on the uh, part of our thing is is privacy. So I'm I, I'm going to be a little fuzzy deliberately. Sure. So we're we've just finished uh, an amazing project in New York, which is incredibly fun. Because also, to work on Fifth Avenue in New York is just completely different. And completely different from coming from that hustle and bustle into yeah. an interior. And parallel to that, we've started an amazing, great to listed mansion, uh, which has to maintain its grandeur. Mm -hmm. But we've been asked to try to sort of signify it, meaning not bring austerity to it because I know that our we have a bit of austerity into our cl clean back staging that we do but the elegance of, of the simplicity of what we do mm. we've been asked to try to translate that into marry with the grandeur of the building that's exciting I mean I'm sure it's, and it's exciting and frustrating I mean you try to work with councils <laughs> can't touch this you have to do this you have to have this floral wallpaper yeah 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 but they're also like some of the most best projects to work on I'm sure like Absolutely. listed buildings as well with character as well buildings with character okay all buildings have character mm -hmm. okay okay so I'm I'm one of these uh, Frank Lloyd Wright fetishists really I mean the hardest buildings to work with are Monica's buildings is you know amped up the pressure yeah. of hitting the nail on the head but it is about respecting each space and each space isn't just it's the architecture mm -hmm. it's the environment it's set in it's also the sounds it comes with is mm -hmm. it in the city or are we talking you know birds yeah uh, and it's a part of the owner so I find that the challenge is always the combination above and also how are you practical you could have a big budget and you can have a small budget it's about things that have wear and tear and things that are just supposed to be beautiful you try to bring up four kids and a dog somewhere where you want something really beautiful yeah how do we how do we marry that i find that that's really great and i actually like that that opens the door to what do we get from high street shops versus collectibles versus we have things made versus what you inherited from your grandmother? Some things will have to be interchangeable because it's going to get worn and torn. Mm -hmm. Some things should be staying with you for the rest of your life and move with you. So all of it's challenging. I, I don't know. I yeah. find that it's really hard. I tend to get excited about whenever we get the opposite of what we're doing at the time. Okay. But do you know what I mean? That's just because... I have the attention span of goldfish and I find that then I get excited. So if you're like, you can work in this room, I'll be like, oh, yay, and then I'm doing that. And you're like, but you can now work in this room. And I'm like, oh, and I'm super excited about that. That makes me more of a dog, actually. But yes, 
I'm quite easily entertained by the challenge and I think all of it has it. I mean, my biggest excitement personally now is we're not doing a playroom, we're doing a play loft. Mm. But it's also like, it's excitement but focus at the same time, I'm sure. Aren't all jobs? Yeah. Yeah. If it's your job, always. Mm. This is where I think, ooh, I had a conversation like this the other day. Sorry, I'm branch out. Uh, I think entrepreneurs and athletes have a lot in common. Yeah. And I think within the creative fields, because I think they both are. If you're an athlete and you have to go above and beyond, it's not only about what you can achieve, but somebody tells you, you're going to have to think outside the box and you mm -hmm. have to be creative. Mm -hmm. You have to find it in you. I think with, with creatives, it's the sort of same thing. And if you run your own as a creative, it's even more apparent that you have focus and that you are disciplined. Because it's not about you, it's about what you achieve. And so it's always going to be about focus. But if you don't have fun, you're going to fall on your face. I don't think you, you hear any athlete, if they don't love their sport, they're going to fail. Yeah. If you're not going to love your job. And that's also part of the focus is, again, about your, how you live your life and your personal happiness. Don't search for the happiness, but that equilibrium, that balance between having fun, being challenged, and do it in a focused manner, like be focused. And that's really hard. But it is also, that's the pleasure. It's an everyday challenge. It's an everyday challenge, but that's why you like it. Yeah. I mean, I've done, we've run this for almost 15 years. It's nuts. But the only reason, and, and there's days, obviously, when you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I need to go to an island and grow coconuts. Uh, it's because the challenge comes from the fact that it, that it entails. I mean, I get the freedom to do all three because there's a new client every time yeah. there's a new person. Yeah. Of course it's a new challenge. So, yeah. What is the best project that you have worked on? I mean, give us... That's a mean question. Yeah. Actually, I'll make it more difficult. Yeah. Give us three. So, in prior, in, in the, like, the best second and third. Ever. Ever. So you have a limited time span, and I now need to think, and I'm blonde. I'm gonna stay school. Best ever. Okay. The New York projects are fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that was amazing to work on. Amazing client, amazing location, and amazing challenge. And, it just, and the result was so soulful. And it was just. And to work that far away with some with a client that that is that passionate about using you yeah. and trusting you, giving you that that was that was a, a, an amazing experience. Uh, I've done one office uh, that was just a beef going. It can just not look like an office. I don't, we don't want it to look like an office. We want this to be feeling really comfortable. It's like what we talked about, yeah. walking into the showroom uh, on a quite limited budget at that. Uh, but we, that was that was also fun because it was hard also because we do so much residential and I personally think that residential is so applicable in the, the commercial sector, but they have to really want it to be that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a few designers that does that really well. And I thought we were quite honored to be honest with that. That was fun. Uh, we've done a castle. That was also when you're like, you want, we want to change and do this, but you can't touch this. That whole thing That's again. It's been amazing. It yeah. is amazing. I mean, mm. the, the first reaction is like, well, no, I'll fail. Like, how are, can I, what, you know, can, yeah. I, can I work on this spot? Uh, at the same time as you pass things, I mean, literally you work there and you're like, oh, mm. you know, so that was at the immediate, and I also think, see, see now I can't do three, see, also, when you come into people's, when the, the, we had, it's a few years ago, we had a, uh, a family, was here in London, it's a big family home, uh, and the tallest people, most beautiful people. Yeah. So we have, we're talking about like two six foot people 
who married each other and had four kids. And you can imagine their 11 year old being like 5'11. You know, so they're like, <laughs> right? So they're like, we're tall, we know it, we're a really tight family. Um, we, have these, we have this long space in the, in the ground floor. We want to be together. So the span, children's been from 11 to 16. Mm -hmm. We want to be together. We need to supervise. We need to leave each other alone, and we're tall. Gosh. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> and she goes, oh, by the way, I've tried to make this house nice, and I think I've got good taste, but I can't make this tie together. I want a grown-up, really sophisticated, sexy space that can handle 11 to 16. Gosh. It's one of the, the best the projects we've ever done. Yeah. I am so proud of that, and I would move in there in a minute. Like, it's so textural. That's actually on our website. Okay. If everybody keeps this sentence in mind, all of that, Kate took for that, that is, I think, it's all just, it's a, I think it's a river, Riverside home. I think Riverside. it's a we, we Riverside family home. We'll put the link on it. In the, in the show notes. It is literally the way that we can, we've custom built furniture that is then soft in the right places, durable in the right places, mm -hmm. hard in the right places, and then the tying together, a lot of the, do you know what? A lot of the texture meets pattern, echoing pattern meets color. Okay. This is a perfect example. So this this project you should put on link is all of what we've talked about is actually represented there. Okay. And hmm. um, now, so now I like your question retrospectively. <laughs> yeah. Um, but making making like that the top three. Yeah. I guess it's not just about the project itself; it's the client. Right, which makes it yes one of those yes working client is everything yeah and there are people who are maybe less nice to work with or less collaborative mm -hmm. uh, to me it's part of my job to adapt and you have to the only thing I would say is I wish people would understand that if you ask somebody to do your house communicate if yeah. you don't answer emails how can I keep your time frame yeah. if you don't talk to me or so it's really difficult for, we have some people who just don't answer emails. They just don't correspond. That, that is incredible. And people are incredibly busy, but that's hard. Otherwise, we, I feel that we get connected to all of our clients. And personality wise, see, even the ones that you may not have connected with if you met them at a dinner, mm. I feel quite intimately about them because you get to know what makes them tick. I may, or, at least I get to know what makes them annoyed, where they don't like to do things. I know how they move and what they're drawn to. I know their attention span. I know, do you know what I mean? You yeah. get to know quite intimate things. So it's, it's hard not to be connected to somebody. Yeah. To that in connection leads to care mm -hmm. automatically. I mean, it may not be people that I want to hug all day, but it ends up being somebody I do care. I guess you have clients that um, stick with you. You were talking about the emails and like responses and communication. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you also have um, clients that, that come in with full of energy, yeah. want it done now, and then you actually start the, the process yeah. disappear. Like they, they're just... They, they disappear. Yeah, that they disappear or that they don't come back to you for a long time. Like they, they... Well, that could be that they're not moving. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's people who come to you, go through what they think they want, yeah. realize that either they can't afford it yeah. or okay. they don't get to buy the house. This, yeah. At this very time, there's a lot of house deals yeah. falling apart. Of course, there's, there's things like that happening. Uh, I don't expect people to... I mean, returning clients is the biggest compliment. It's also a luxury. Yeah. We have certain clients who may be able to afford to buy several houses. Sure. Or who are... And also, there's a very uh, modern, the modern day person. I mean, personally, I only lived there for four years, it seems. I didn't, I didn't deliberately. It just looks like a pattern I've started to create. Okay. And I think that maybe I represent a clientele level, so there's people who do. But there's also people who go, This is my forever house. Yeah. And then I don't really hear from them again. Thank you. Like, I did actually, uh, I've done a forever house for somebody five, six years ago, and I got an email from, some, from her two days ago saying, I'm going to buy a Martin in Barcelona. Okay. I mean, so 
I don't expect people to come back and do things because mm -hmm. doing your house costs money yeah. and an effort and you know what? It's quite stressful. Mm -hmm. Which is why, please, people, don't do it when you're pregnant and changing jobs. <laughs> okay. and, you know, it is, it is an incredibly pressured thing. Yeah. It? But in, this is also where we're there for, yeah. to relieve that, take care of some of the pressure. But yeah, returning clients, I don't know if that signifies, to me, that's a compliment. Yeah. It's again a little bit like the awards you didn't ask for. If they come back, that means that that's you feel good. good. Or if people have referred. Since yeah. we don't advertise, that's really great. But it shouldn't be a signer, signature for no. for people. I mean, use what's me the, once and that should be a good investment. What's the, you mentioned New York, you've mentioned Barcelona. Um, what's been your furthest client? For, furthest has been in New York, actually. It has, yeah. Yeah. We've been approached now to do things in like Doha. Uh, haven't that hasn't materialized so I don't know I'd be I mean to me distance isn't it's, it's in, the distance isn't the issue no it's about them being really clear with the structure of how you work I was so just, it's yeah. clear this is not I mean take away the fluff a little bit mm. what your interior designer should be able to do it is about breaking down the structure and educating you as the client of what does this mean and what's the time frame? Mm. And who do we need involved? And do you have these people? Mm -hmm. And so, for us to work f over distance, obviously it needs to be a, a connection, we need to have a point of contact. Yep. And there needs to be an agreement and understanding in unison of time frames and problems. It could be customs mm. problems, it could be storage problems, installation, permits, I mean all of this thing. So I think part of our a massive part of our service is obviously incredibly technical and then to just break it down in project management really uh, you mentioned Pinterest as one of the things that you use yeah um, and that's a good sense I, I mean Pinterest to me is it is a key to my clients yeah. because Pinterest allow people even who are not having a lot of time to yeah. just pull pictures you like yeah. Or can comment on pictures yeah. or whatnot, and we can, and they feel connected. And especially, also, don't forget, people marry each other because they love each other, not because they agree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you're gonna do different things. So we can have a husband that has a lot of strong opinions, and he runs the show. And then we have a wife who may not run the show, but she has a lot of opinions too. She just doesn't post them as loudly, or vice versa. Yeah. So we can have two pictures, and we can follow you both, so they don't have to see each other if it's a necessity. So to me. It's just a method. Instead of saying, you have to go and spend money on buying 16 magazines. I still buy magazines, but then I'm from this era, but it's also, I think it's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, it is. I will always love it, and I think that people should. Mm -hmm. I also think people should buy magazines because you can keep them. And it's, hey, who goes to the hairdresser? I'm not knowing it, but I actually think sitting, I, I'm still one of those who have them in my living room. Yeah. I love magazines. But with Pinterest um, being one of them, I wanted to talk about like the possibility that it's opened up with technology um, to be able to, as an interior designer, work anywhere in the world. Yes, yes. And but that's the thing. I mean, yeah. we Skype and we FaceTime. Yeah. I mean, so this is the thing. So why New York probably just went and super smooth? And I was so scared of that not working so smooth because I've lived in New York for many years, as you can hear. And I know that patience isn't... Uh, synonym that you connect with, you, you know, with, with New York or New Yorkers. But to then be able to have a contractor there who's literally like any question, FaceTime. Yeah. There yeah. or there, yeah. you know? This was just, technology is amazing. Mm. FaceTime there, we can do it even in Skype. I mean, the, the business Skype, I can, can, I can have a, a conference with several people. Yeah. So that's great. And with that, I can pull things from, from desktops. Yeah. Pinterest is, is more, of, this is the fastest and easiest way <laughs> on your phone and on that you can actually express yourself when you're asking for help. Because if you're asking for help, it's part of, partially because you're like, I, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I want to give this to you to do this. Yeah. So you can't ask for too much, but it's, it's good. It's it's it's. I mean, technology is amazing. It is. It's a problem, but it's it can, yeah, it's a problem. No, too. but it is also a problem. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what the problem is a little bit is everybody's suddenly a dealer, right? Mm -hmm. So when I go in, if I could buy this chair online, and there's some 
really nice retouched pictures floating around the internet and you buy it and you can't refund it and you get it and you go, oh, this is, this cushion's not, this is really not comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Or a rug, this is look really shiny and funny. It, the yeah. internet is a deception. It is. A, a, not deception, it's, it's a maze of deception. And so I do still feel that people need to remember that the tactility to feel and to see in real life and then if you cannot, because the world is smaller with mm -hmm. the internet, trust the person you've hired. Sometimes we buy things for people and we're going to have to be like, we've checked all the angles, Trust we have to trust us on this. Because they go, I'm going to try it. And yeah. you go, yeah, it's a 20 grand sofa, they're not going to let you no. try it, sorry. <laughs> and it's, it's in Germany yeah. or whatever, but we will then make sure that this works. So the internet is amazing and I don't know if we could work on this scale, if it wasn't for the technology. Mm. It also opens up uh, doors for fraud. It opens for, it's easy to be tricked, this whole DIY thing where people yeah. get tricked. I mean, there's platforms that I don't think I should name that actually makes everything sound like you can just copy it, right? You can just get mm. the lock. You can just get this, but you, this is, you can't. No, no, no. Well, you can, but you'll then break it and you've spent more what looks like less money, but you're going to have to fix it. And it's, it's, it's almost yeah. fraud. It is a little bit of trickery. And people have always been, it's not about being gullible, it's about you want the best in people, right? So you want to find the solution, you want to find the deal. Mm. You don't Do actually you want to turn the tap and the tap comes off in your hand. You really don't want that. But if you bought it from China online, it will, it will <laughs> do that. And so there, there are these things, and this is again where I think it comes back to credibility as a designer. Yeah. You have to trust us, but I have to. I guess I have to gain my trust. So this, that, where I think when we've been here all along, Sigmar's where it is. It's going to look the same. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet me, Nina. So our guarantee is we're going to still be here. It's very personal. Yeah, it yeah. is personal. So we're going to. So if I if I screw you over, you're going to find me, right? Yeah. So that is hopefully also a little bit of if we stick to what we do well. And we all make mistakes, obviously, whatever else, but on the same note, you can still find us. So I think that this is where I'm hoping that technology mm. still makes way for personal connection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, think, do you find that having the shop front has actually helped in your career, like in the growth of... of oh, my God. Yeah. A, without my business partner, I wouldn't be here. Like, we, we are a team. And without the team we've built, mm. everybody who works for us... I couldn't have done this in a million years. Uh, no, I just happen to be like a, an instigator, I think. I think that the shop front is everything. Yeah. The shop front is everything. It's somewhere to go. So It's, it's, it's somewhere, somewhere to, to go. go. It makes it real. It makes it small. Mm. Which I think, again, it's personable. Yeah. Yeah. It's personable. It's literally... We're here and you can see it and you can talk to us and you can come in and I think this is incredibly important. And I don't think we'll ever change that no matter what direction we take. Um, I don't want the by appointment only. Yeah. It's not our thing really. It needs to be Open door in. policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's for us anyway. Yeah. You know? Eva, it has been absolutely wonderful speaking with you. Ditto. Um, where can people find you other than coming to the shop on King's Road? Yeah, 263 King's Road is, is Sigmar's showroom and, and the interior design office address. Otherwise, it's sigmarlondon.com is our website. Okay. You'll put some links. Sure, absolutely. Right? absolutely. Otherwise, for email, uh, email me at ebba at sigmarlondon.com or email info at sigmarlondon.com. Are you on Instagram as well? Yes, we have two Instagram accounts. Okay. Uh, probably because okay, so we have a, a, a Sigmar London, which is the organized, really nice shop version. Okay. That doesn't have the crap on it, so I put crap on mine. <laughs> so there's mine, and mine is Eba Sigmar. Okay. Uh, Eba Sigmar and Sigmar London, and both of them are Instagram accounts, and uh, also we're there to like each other's pictures, just in case nobody else likes them. Amazing. You should always have two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice.